Hi, it's James Clark here. Welcome to an introduction to Lab Chart Reader. Most of you now have worked in the lab on a couple of occasions and uh, done some recording using Lab Chart or Chart software um, in conjunction with an AD Instruments um, Power Lab or Mac Lab system. And you've recorded analog data, it's been converted into a digital format and it's been sampled um, at any uh, sample rate of your choosing into chart or lab chart. Uh, this data now you can save of course, you can edit it within lab chart, save it onto a memory stick, take it home uh, and you can download this program which is lab chart reader, you can see lab chart reader uh, this is from AD Instruments, you download it from their website www.adinstruments.com and when you've downloaded it and installed it on your computer it's available as a PC or a Mac version, you can then read the data from the lab chart or chart software. Um, the only thing you can't do is you can't record new data, you can't save data, and you can't use any of the analysis modules or extensions. It's quite possible that during your experiment you used uh, a respiratory module or you use some of the extensions maybe to record video or add other things to your data set. Well with lab chart reader sadly you cannot use those extensions or modules with your data so you have to make sure you've uh, saved your data in a way that you don't need to use those extensions but uh, disregarding that for the moment the most important thing as you can see here on the screen you can open lab chart or chart data files you can import other file formats as well you can view scroll through your data set up and modify calculations and analysis so you add channels and do some analysis um, you can do some of the in extensions, the cardiac axis and the spirometry extensions you can run um, and you can analyze data and you can print from it um, you just can't record any new data so this is what you're faced with when you open lab chart reader up it's a standard windows or mac program so you've got the usual uh, menus at the top here file to open uh, file, we've got a list of files I've already opened here uh, in the preferences window under the edit you've got the feature manager which of offers you the opportunity to check for updates I um, recommend you leave this on because it's always best to have the latest version of this software in order to get your analysis done um, the setup commands uh, boxes don't do anything until you've actually got some data on the screen so we'll come to that in a second and there's the usual window box which allows you to cascade or arrange your windows on your screen and a quite a, a good help menu which allows you to visit the AD Instruments website, go to a forum, uh, check for updates, do various configuration options and of course there's a help file which helps you um, find functions that maybe you don't know where they are. So I'm going to start by just loading uh, a file that um, we've used for a previous practical. This is um, some data from the experimental physiology uh, third year undergraduate module and you can see here we've got quite complex data uh, there's a number of channels these were all recorded using uh, lab chart uh, and a power lab system from various sources we've got flow which was coming from a um, spirometry flow module uh, volume which was from the spirometry flow module uh, we've got CO2 which we uh, recorded to get end tidal CO2s and this was taken from a Servimex we got O2 also from a Servimex, BP blood pressure which was taken from a Finipress finger blood pressure monitor uh, in real time. We've got heart rate which um, I believe was taken from either an ECG output or was taken from the Finipress heart rate output. And right at the bottom here we've got a SpO2 which was taken from a um, blood saturation finger monitor. So there's a lot of data on the screen all acquired using um, lab chart in the laboratory. And you can see here there are also comments which were written during the recording and you can see they're numbered sequentially. Um, we can scroll through our data, we can have a look at the start and we can look at the end. Uh, using the scroll bar at the bottom here. Um, you may want to zoom in on your data and very much like um, lab chart, the full version of lab chart, you can zoom in using these two buttons down the bottom here. This one expands the scaling so you can zoom in quite a lot and then scroll through and the one on the, on the left here compresses the scaling you can see here it's essentially zooming out. It's not changing the vertical scaling it's merely changing the horizontal scaling of your data. So now we've loaded the data file, let's have a look at first of all the drop down menus and then some of the buttons and work out what they all do. So the file menu you already know, of course if you try and click on save it'll tell you that you cannot save using Lab Chart Reader and you have to buy the full version. So 
don't try and save because you won't be able to. You can print. Um, I recommend you use the print preview button before printing. So for instance you can select an area of data on the screen using your mouse. So just click and highlight an area of data. Go to file, print preview and you can see here it's just showing you that selection of data printed on the screen. Of course this isn't the kind of data you'd want to print but you can see how simple it is. You can just select an area of data, go to file, print preview and there you are. Of course for these kind of data you probably want to set your page up slightly differently so you can go to page setup and you can choose whether you have a, a landscape or a portrait page. I'm going to change this to landscape and then I can go back to print preview and now it's in a landscape view and you can see we've got our data again on the side here. So you've got the option to be able to uh, print data. The print file is actually quite interesting. It depends on where you're zoomed in. For instance, remember I just selected this data here and pressed file print and you can see it's, it's all crammed into the left hand side which isn't very useful and that's because it's crammed in on the screen. If I zoom in and now press file print preview the data are spread out on the screen. So use that to your advantage. Zoom in as much as you can, fill the data with on your screen, then go to File Print Preview and you can see it'll print the data fully expanded on your on your printer. I'm not going to print this, I'll just press close. So that's a little hint that's useful to know. If you expand what you see on the screen, it'll then print it on the screen properly. Um, other options here are just to load other files. Um, you've got here some editing functions. You can cut and copy data. If you uh, copy the lab chart reader data as it is on the screen here, selecting this data, edit and copy. This is actually copying. You can see it's asking us we're copying channel 3 and we can select any one or combination of channels. So I'm choosing channel 3. And what it will do is it will copy the data point by point. This data was sampled at 1000 Hz, that's 1000 samples per second. So when it copies these data, it'll copy every single data point and the interval of the data will be at one sample. So you will get 1000 samples per second and if you imported that text file that it'll export into Excel for instance and you've only selected one second of data, you will have 1000 data points vertically in a column each one separated by a millisecond. So uh, be wary about exporting data as text files. If you're going to do this, you may find you want to downsample by a number of samples, for instance every tenth sample if it's fairly slow data, um, so you don't export too much data. Um, exporting data is really only any good if you want to then replot your data using another program. Um, it's very rare you want to export the raw data. Uh, and there are other tutorials on this uh, site that will tell you how to export uh, summary data, mean data and other things. So um, it's something that's quite useful but uh, for this kind of purpose, for doing the analysis that we do in, in our physiology labs, it's not the most useful function. So we'll cancel those windows there. Um, so that's the copy. You can obviously paste data, you can paste data at the end, so if I've copied some data earlier on I can then paste it at the end. Bear in mind if you paste any data or make any changes to these data files you can't save them, so it's a function that you have to be wary about. Um, we have had many students leave their laptops on for weeks on end because they're frightened of closing down lab chart on the off chance that they lose all the analysis they've just done. There's also a uh, preferences button here where you can select your uh, updates again as we saw before and there's also a cursor. You can choose what kind of shape cursor you have. It's actually quite nice maybe to choose a different shape cursor which may help you in isolating data points later. So you've got those options there. In the setup box we've got the option to change display settings and change channel settings. So I'll click on channel settings and this is very much like the channel settings box you see in lab chart, the full version when you're setting up an experiment. It allows you to add channels down the bottom so we can add a number of channels you can see on the screen appearing 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Equally so you can remove channels. You can change the color of the channels here and you can add any calculations you want to do to your data on this screen. And again there are other tutorials that talk about adding channels and adding calculations. But this is an important menu to remember you can relabel your channels. For instance, BP, I may want to relabel blood pressure. Press OK. And now the BP channel is relabeled down here. You can see it says blood pressure, not just BP. So that's a useful menu to remember.
There's also the display settings menu. This is more of a click box uh, type menu. You can choose whether the time is displayed from the start of the block or the start of the file or the time of the day. You can ask whether the time is only ex expressed in seconds. can get a bit confusing when you're recording for 30 minutes or so. Quite a lot of seconds in there. You can ask it to display the date. You can have a black background for one of the views, the scope view. You can change the color of your graticule. This is actually quite nice. You can see in the background here where my cursor is, these little light blue dotted lines. You can change that to a different color. And you'll see now that our graticule has become slightly darker. And this may help if you've got a, a little low um, contrast screen. You can change the color of that. Let's go back to display settings. Um, you can put lines between blocks, uh, I'll tell you what that means in a second, and you can show comments, and obviously it's quite important, you can see here we've got various comments, quite useful to have those comments written there. Um, and you can change from having a line graticule or a dot graticule. Um, lines between blocks, I'll show you what that means, if I scroll across and find a point where I've started recording, here we are, these big blue lines here, this is where when I've been recording I've pressed the start and the stop button. So I've pressed stop for a few minutes, obviously fiddled with something and then press start again. It's put these big blue blocks in. That's actually really useful. If I go and hide those, it's now hidden the blocks and it looks like the data are continuous. You'll see that it isn't continuous. If you zoom in on the bottom line here, look at the time scale. It goes up to 20 seconds, then starts again, goes to 140, starts again, goes to 40, starts again, starts up at 20, then goes back to zero again here. So actually I would recommend in the display settings to leave this line between these blocks turned on. At least then you know, having a big blue line here, where you've pressed the start and stop button, and that time isn't continuous. There is discontinuous time recording. Of course during your experiment, if I zoom right out and look across at the experiment, there are no blue lines. The experiment started at this point here and finished 26 or so, 27 minutes later. So it's worth keeping the blue lines in just to make sure that there's been no uh, discontinuity in your data, that the fact that it's continuous data all the way through. There are some experiments where in fact you are only recording for two seconds and getting rid of these lines may be advantageous simply just to, to look at the screen and a bit more comfort. So that's the setup window. The commands window is very, very important. Um, you would have used the command window during um, the recording, perhaps to add comments or to set markers and various other things. Um, you can add comments retrospectively, which is actually quite useful. So for instance, I can look through this data point, and I remember in my notebook it said that at four minutes something happened. You know, let's say the person finger cuff fell off or the person coughed or stopped pedaling or whatever they're doing in their experiment. So after the event you can come back to your data file, click on the four minute mark and then you can go command add comment and you can type in a comment from for instance subject stopped cycling for 30 seconds. Yeah, you could write that there and you can insert it at the selection and you can choose which channel you insert it on and I'm going to choose all channels add it and you can see now it's added subject stopped cycling 30 seconds and it's called it point 29 the reason it's called it point 29 is it is the 29th comment that I've made on this data file comments normally start from the beginning and finish at the end but you can see I've added 29 here and you'll also notice 26 was added after the event as well and I think there's 27 somewhere in here as well that's added after the event. Um, you can move comments in this program if you click on this um, if you click on the comment here it's selected a little black dot in the comment you can go to command and you can um, you can move comments as well um, for instance I've added subject stop cycling I look back at my notebook and actually says they stopped cycling at two minutes not four minutes so I can click where it says 29 and using my right mouse button right click and you can see here down the bottom move comment I can move it to over here two minutes and let go You can also move comments. Um, for instance, I may have looked back in my lab book and thought, oh, actually, no, it wasn't four minutes, it was two minutes that the subject stopped cycling, or I've put a mark in the wrong place and you've made a note in your lab book that it's in the wrong place. You can move it after the event. You simply click 
on the number itself, and you'll see this little black dot appearing just above it, and the cursor changes to a double-headed arrow. I can click, and I can drop somewhere else, let's say two minutes, and now it's moved this comment. This doesn't give you the excuse not to make comments and to add them after your experiment, but it does give you the opportunity to move comments within Lab Chart Reader. Bear in mind, of course, you can't save, so you can't save the new position of these comments. So it's always best to get your comments in the right place at the right time when you're doing the recording. You've got an option here to go to the start of the data nice and simply. There we are at the beginning. Another command to go to the end of the data. Um, the relevance of that isn't particularly useful in the analysis, but um, you can just scroll quite quickly and go from the start to the end, but it's quite a nice one to have. Um, auto scale or channels is quite a useful uh, command, control U, there's also a button we'll come to in a minute. Click on it and it scales all the channels within the view so they fit into view. For instance over here you can see that the O2 is a very small little willy line here and I may want to fill this with it. So I just go to command, auto scale and you can now see that it's scaled the O2. There's a little blip here so if I'm zoomed in a little bit closer, there we are, and I go to Command Auto Scale. You can see that it's now scaled all the data, so it fits into the available space. Uh, this is nice for analysis. It's nice to be able to look at your data in this way. If there are small changes, you might miss it if it's all crammed up the top. That's quite a useful command to have. You've also got other options to set selection. You can ask it to select certain points, find various points, and then Add to Datapad and Multiple Add to Datapad are used in other tutorials which you can read up about later. Um, the window box isn't particularly useful in terms of analysis and all of these commands are replicated by buttons so we'll come to those buttons across the top next. Um, the file buttons we've got here opening various files the print button prints uh, just like the print menu does however the print button just prints I would recommend you go to print preview rather than just print uh, we can select an area here, click print, and it just says print. It won't give you the option to preview what you're printing. So I do suggest you use file print preview rather than just pressing print. A quite a useful function is the find button. So let's say we've uh, finished our recording, we click on the find button, and we can search for data, we can search for comments or markers. I'm going to choose comment. I'm going to search for a comment with the word subject on it, and I know that I've entered one uh, comment saying subject stopped cycling and I can ask it to select five seconds around uh, actually five seconds after that uh, note where it had said subject I'm going to search backwards because I know it's prior to where I am at the moment I'm going to press find and you can see what it's done is it's found the point that says subject stopped cycling which was the last w mention of the word subject and it's selected five seconds of data following that subject. So the find box can be quite useful. And you can find again another useful button. I've already selected subject as my search criteria. Click on that button. It'll find the next word subject and it'll mark five seconds. So you can see how this might be useful if you've used comments correctly. You can actually use this to select bits of data repetitively to be able to uh, perhaps add them to your data pad or, or save them for later. So they're useful functions to have. Um, this next button here auto scales all the channels, so we've, it's the same as the command U function we used earlier. So let's say we're zoomed in somewhere and we can see that this heart rate trace disappears off the bottom then comes back up again. If I click on this button, it rescales all the channels, so now all the data are visible on the screen at the same time, which is quite nice. This button here continuously auto scales all the time, so at the moment it's disabled. If I click on it, it goes green, and as I scan through my data set, you can see there we are, as if by magic, pew, the data rescales itself, which is actually very, very useful. It's a function that was introduced in thinking version 6 of Lab Chart, and it is very, very good. So that's the basic function that's useful. We've then got the data pad, um, viewing the data pad, adding data to the data pad, multiple adds to data pad, and the mini window. Um, these are things we'll talk about in another tutorial. Um, you can view your comment list just by clicking on here. You can choose any of your comments, clip on it, and it'll take you to that comment and center it in the center of the screen, which is a very useful function. You can add comments, so you can select an area, click on add comment, and that's the same as going command, add comment, and you can add a comment. The various windows we'll come to now are actually quite useful. We are currently in chart view. This first button here is chart view, so clicking on it makes no difference at all. 
There are some experiments you might do using scope view, essentially that's an oscilloscope type view, um, which is quite useful. The third button here is zoom view. We'll come to the use of zoom view later in another tutorial, but for instance you can select an area of data such as this data, click on zoom view, and you can see it's quite literally just zoomed in on the data, and you can then examine your data in quite some detail. Another function of the zoom view is you can select a number of data sets and view them all simultaneously in the zoom view. So if I select a whole area here, and I'm doing this by clicking below this little line at the bottom, you can see my cursor changes shape to this little line with double arrows. This allows me to select all the data. So I've selected all these data sets, click on zoom view. It's loaded all the data on top of each other, which when you look at it first, you think, what the heck's the point in that? It gives you the opportunity to see whether data are aligned or not, but then you click on this second stacked mode button, and you can see now it's nicely lined up all your data. And if I wanted to print that, I could go to File, Print Zoom View, and you can see it's going to print a really nice view of all of our different channels, all labeled correctly. So um, that's quite a useful function to know about, the fact you can do this um, stacked mode zoom view. The stacked mode only shows the channels that are visible on the screen at that time and we'll just change that now and I'll show you how that works. For instance I've got this view where I've got the um, respiratory flow trace, um, volume which wasn't recording in this instance and some gases. Maybe I just want to show the flow and the two gases. So using your cursor you can hold your cursor over one of these dividing lines between channels and you can move the channel and hide it. So you can see what I'm doing here as I'm moving all of those out of the way. So now all I've got on the screen is the three channels I'm interested in, the flow, the CO2, and the O2. Now I'll go back to my zoom view, and now you've got one, two, three, just the three channels we're interested in. A very useful function. Um, and I said if you want to align things, I'll demonstrate what I mean by that. So let's close that window. Let's push that off the top. So now we've just got these two data sets. Let's just select a nice little area here click on zoom view, go back to the overlay mode, I can then look at these two traces and see whether they are temporarily aligned, if the time alignment works. And there are other tutorials on how you can change this time alignment, so I won't bother talking about that now. So zoom view is a very useful one to have to be able to interrogate data to look at things closely. So now I've squashed a load of channels and I've resized windows and everything's gone funny and I want to return it back to where I was before. You can hold your mouse over any of the dividing lines, so this one here, or this one here for instance, and double click, and everything rescales back to the full view. Very useful function to know as well there. The next view here is the XY view. Um, this is normally only of use if you're comparing two parameters and trying to look at um, relationships between two things, for instance pressure volume loops are viewed in loop view. Um, spectrum view again is only really relevant where you're looking at complex repetitive data and you want to see how those data uh, change over time and what their various uh, frequency spectrum are so we won't bother with that at the moment. And then last there's movie view. There are a number of practicals now we're doing uh, in our classes where we are actually uh, real recording video at the same time as data and if you clicked on movie view it would load up a a view of the movie, but in, in this case there is no movie, therefore we've got nothing to see. And um, finally the layout view, these are the standard windows options, you've got tile, you've got tile mini windows, and new layout. Um, mini windows are very useful, um, they're used in other tutorials, I call them DVMs, uh, digital voltage meters or mini windows. Um, they are windows showing you what data you have on the screen, and the way you get these little windows up is by clicking on where it says the data up here, it says no sampling, clicking and dragging, and these are mini windows showing you the data points and where your cursor is, so I'm just adding a whole load of little mini windows here. And as I move my mouse across the screen, you can see that these mini windows are changing to tell me what the data point is at that moment. So now if I click on layout, tile mini windows, it'll automatically, you can see there, arrange all my mini windows so they're across the top of the screen. So that's quite a useful function to have. Smart tile and tile, they do pretty much the same thing. Um, smart tile, essentially, you can see it's covered up this top menu bar. It's tried to be smart and save space, whereas the tile mini windows has revealed this top bar so I can actually minimize and maximize this other window. And then finally we've got 
new layout where you can actually save layouts uh, within your setting. And this isn't particularly useful in Lab Chart Reader because you won't be able to save any of this, but if you wanted to do this in Lab Chart, it's quite a useful function. So that's basically an overview of the menus and the buttons that we can use in Lab Chart Reader. Um, there are a few other functions you may want to know about. Um, one quite interesting function is uh, the split view mu mode. Um, if you move your cursor over to the far left hand side, you'll see it changes to a double headed white arrow. If I click and drag, I've then got two screens. These two screens behave independently. They are the same data set but they behave independently so I can scroll one and not scroll the other I can zoom in on one and not zoom in on the other so what I would recommend you use this for is perhaps have one window over the left hand side showing you all of your data and then maybe on the right hand side you can scroll through your data to do your analysis and you give you an idea, you can see where my cursor is here it gives you an idea of the data you're selecting on the left hand side so you know where you are in relation to the whole experiment. It's quite a useful function to have to be able to understand where you are in an experiment and make sure you're in the right place when selecting data. Um, another useful function is the um, scaling options. It may be that the auto scale isn't what you want. So for instance I'm just going to pull all these out of the way and just show on the screen, let's get rid of that window as well, and just show on the screen here the end tidal CO2 I may want to zoom in just on this top area here so having this auto scale is really quite annoying because every time I zoom out and zoom in it rescales my data for me so I may want to turn that off and then on the left hand side here you can see again the cursor changes it's got a double headed arrow which allows me to then to move the scale up and down it's got a double pointy arrow like this one which allows me to stretch the scale you can see it's stretching it down and then stretching it up leaving zero where it is and stretching all the other numbers in relation to zero so I can compact my data down okay and then the third option is the arrow pointing down this time it leaves the top number intact and expands the bottom so you can see here I can scroll down and stretch out so by doing this you can stretch down to zero and then stretch up and you can then feed your, fit your data into whatever size screen you want. So if I'm interested in just the tops of these numbers, let's do some measurements. I can scroll everything out of the way and I can really highlight the scaling just on the tops of the numbers to be able to read data points if I wanted to. And then to rescale it, you either click on the auto scale all channels or you can click on this little drop down list and click on auto scale and it'll scale it all for you. And then I'll double click on here and return back to our full view. So I think that gives an overview of all the functionality of Lab Chart Reader, the zooming, the moving around, navigating through your data, and what all the buttons do. So I hope that gives you all a little bit of a hint as to how to get started, at least looking through your data and trying to work out what's going on.